Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries. Norwegian Heavy Water Sabotage The Norwegian Heavy Water Sabotage was a series of operations undertaken by Norwegian saboteurs during World War II to prevent the German nuclear weapon project from acquiring heavy water, which could have been used by the Germans to produce nuclear weapons. In 1934, at Vemork, Norway, Norsk Hydro built the first commercial plant capable of producing heavy water as a byproduct of fertilizer production. It had a capacity of 12 tons per year. During World War II, the Allies decided to remove a heavy water supply and destroy the heavy water plant in order to inhibit the German development of nuclear weapons. Raids were aimed at the 60 megawatts of Amork power station at the Jukan waterfall in Telemark, Norway. Prior to the German invasion of Norway on 9 April 1940, the Dusi M Bureau removed 185 kilograms of heavy water from the plant in Vemork in then neutral Norway. The plant's managing director, Obert, agreed to lend the heavy water to France for the duration of the war. The French transported it secretly to Oslo, to Perth, Scotland, and then to France. The plant remained capable of producing heavy water. The Allies remained concerned that the occupation forces would use the facility to produce more heavy water for their weapons program. Between 1940 and 1944, a sequence of sabotage actions by the Norwegian resistance movement, as well as Allied bombing, ensured the destruction of the plant and the loss of the heavy water produced. These operations, codenamed Grouse, Freshman, and Gunnicide, finally managed to knock the plant out of production in early 1943. In Operation Grouse, the British Special Operations Executive successfully placed four Norwegian nationals as an advance team in the region of the Hardanger Plateau, above the plant in October 1942. The unsuccessful Operation Freshman was mounted the following month by British paratroopers. They were to rendezvous with the Norwegians of Operation Grouse and proceed to Vemork. This attempt failed when the military gliders crashed short of their destination, as did one of the tugs, a Handley Page Halifax bomber. The other Halifax returned to base, but all the other participants were killed in the crashes or captured, interrogated, and executed by the Gestapo. In February 1943, a team of so-trained Norwegian commandos succeeded in destroying the production facility with a second attempt, Operation Gunnicide. Operation Gunnicide was later evaluated by SO as the most successful act of sabotage in all of World War II. These actions were followed by Allied bombing raids. The Germans elected to cease operation and remove the remaining heavy water to Germany. Norwegian resistance forces sank the ferry, SF Hydro on Lake Din, preventing the heavy water from being removed. Technical Background Enrico Fermi and his colleagues studied the results of bombarding uranium with neutrons in 1934. The first person who mentioned the idea of nuclear fission in 1934 was Ida Nodak. Four years after the Fermi publication, in December 1938, Lise Meitner and Otto Frisch correctly interpreted the radiochemical experimental results of Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann as evidence of nuclear fission. News of this discovery spread quickly among physicists, and it was realized that if chain reactions could be controlled, fission might lead to a new source of great power. What was needed was a substance that could moderate the energy of neutrons emitted in radioactive decay so that they could be captured by other fissile nuclei. Heavy water and graphite were the prime candidates for moderating the energy of neutrons. When Nazi Germany investigated the production of an atomic bomb, a range of options was identified. Although historical records provide limited detail on the German decision to pursue the heavy water approach, it became clear after the war that they had explored the option. Although ultimately unsuccessful, the approach chosen has been demonstrated to be technically viable. Approaches to developing a weapon in nuclear weapon development, the main problem is securing sufficient weapons grade material. In particular, it is difficult to acquire either fissile isotopes of uranium 235 or of 239 Pu. Weapons grade uranium requires mining, extracting, and enriching natural ore. Alternatively, plutonium can be bred in reactors fueled by unenriched uranium, which requires chemical separation of the 239 poo produced. Unlike the Allies, 
who pursued both the enrichment of uranium and the production of plutonium. German scientists only focused on plutonium production, as this method was less expensive. Plutonium production Although the most common isotope of uranium, uranium-238, can be used as secondary fissionable material in hydrogen bombs, it cannot be used as the primary fissile material for an atomic bomb. 238U can be used to produce 239 Pu. Through the fission of 235U which produces neutrons, some of which will be absorbed by 238U creating 239U. After a few days the 239U will decay, turning into weapons usable 239 Pu. The Germans did not examine ultra-pure graphite because they did not know that the graphite they had tried was too impure to sustain a chain reaction, and abandoned it as a possible moderator. They instead settled on the heavy water-based reactor design. A heavy water-moderated nuclear reactor could be used to do nuclear fission research, and, ultimately, to breed plutonium from which a bomb could be constructed. Heavy Water Production In normal water, there is only one deuterium atom for every 6,400 hydrogen atoms, but deuterium is more prevalent in the residue of water used as an electrolyte. An analysis of the residues from the Vermorke hydroelectric plant, a large-scale hydrogen production plant using electrolysis of water for ammonia production, showed a hydrogen slash deuterium ratio of 48, most of the deuterium being bound in HDO molecules. Leftronstad then a lecturer at the Norwegian Institute of Technology and Jomar Brun, head of the hydrogen plant put forward a proposal in 1933, the year heavy water was first isolated, for a project, which was accepted by Norsk Hydro, and production started in 1935. The technology is straightforward. Heavy water is separated from normal water by electrolysis because the difference in mass between the two hydrogen isotopes translates into a slight difference in the speed at which the reaction proceeds. To produce pure heavy water by electrolysis requires a large cascade of electrolysis chambers, and consumes large amounts of power. Since there was excess power available, heavy water could be purified from the existing electrolyte. As a result, Norsk Hydro became the heavy water supplier for the world's scientific community, as a by-product of fertilizer production for which the ammonia was used. Hans Seuss was a German advisor to the production of heavy water. Seuss had assessed the Vermorck plant as being incapable of producing militarily useful quantities of heavy water in less than five years, at its then capacity. Pre-invasion efforts French research considered production of 239 Pu using reactors moderated by both heavy water and graphite. Preliminary French research indicated that the graphite which was then available commercially was not pure enough to serve the purpose, and that heavy water would be required. The German research community had reached a similar conclusion, and in January 1940 had procured additional heavy water from Vemork. The German firm McFarben, which was a partial owner of Norsk Hydro, had ordered 100 kg slash month. Norsk Hydro's maximum production rate was then limited to 10 kg slash month. In 1940, the Dazi M Bureau directed three French agents, Captain Muller and Lieutenants Moss and Noldemers, to remove the world's extant supply, 185 kg of heavy water, from the Vemork plant in then neutral Norway. The Norsk Hydro General Director Axel Obert, agreed to lend the heavy water to France, for the duration of the war, observing that if Germany won the war, he was likely to be shot. Transportation was difficult as German military intelligence maintained a presence in Norway, and had been alerted of ongoing French activities in Norway. Had they become aware of the shipment, they might have attempted to intercept it. The French transported it secretly to Oslo, to Perth. Scotland and then to France. When France was invaded the French nuclear scientist Frédéric Joliot Curie took charge of the material, hiding it first in a Banque de France vault, and then in a prison. Joliot Curie then moved it to Bordeaux, where it, plus research papers, and most of the scientists boarded the British tramp steamer, which was one of the many merchant ships involved in saving over 200,000 troops and civilians in the three weeks after Dunkirk. 
The ship already had industrial diamonds, machinery and a number of British evacuees aboard. SS Broom Park delivered its passengers and cargo, together with all of the free supply of heavy water, to Falmouth on 21 June. The award of an OBE to Captain Paulson was recorded in the London Gazette of 4 February 1941. Crucial to the success of the mission was the role played by Charles Howard, 20th Earl of Suffolk. Although the ready inventory of heavy water was removed, the plant remained capable of producing heavy water. In investigations of collaboration launched by Norwegian authorities after the war, Norsk Hydra management's collaboration with the Germans was considered. General Director Robert's cooperation with the French aided the Norsk Hydro case. Operations Grouse and Freshmen Destruction of the Vermork plant was mounted by the Combined Operations Headquarters in November 1942. The plan consisted of two operations. The first would drop a number of Norwegian locals into the area as an advance force. And once they were in place a party of British engineers would be landed by military glider to attack the plant itself. On 19 October 1942, a four-man team of special operations executive trained Norwegian commandos parachuted into Norway. From their drop point in the wilderness they had to ski a long distance to the plant, so considerable time was given to complete this part of the mission, known as Operation Grouse. This plan, unlike prior failures, included the team's studying and memorizing blueprints. Once the Norwegian Grouse team managed to make contact with the British, the British were suspicious, as they had not heard from the SO team for a long time. They had been dropped at the wrong place and had gone off course from there several times. The secret question took the form of, what did you see in the early morning of? The Grouse team replied, three pink elephants. The British were ecstatic at the success of the Norwegian team's insertion, and the next phase of operations commenced. On 19 November 1942, Operation Freshman followed with the planned glider-borne landing on frozen Lake Mosfat near the plant. Two airspeed horse gliders, towed by Handley Page Halifax bombers, each glider carrying two pilots and 15 Royal Engineers of the 9th Field Company, 1st British Airborne Division, took off from RAF Skitten near Wick in Gaithness. The towing of gliders had always been hazardous, but in this case it was made worse by the long flying distance to Norway and poor weather conditions which severely restricted visibility. One of the Halifax tugs crashed into a mountain, killing all seven aboard. Its glider was able to cast off, but crashed nearby, resulting in several casualties. The other Halifax arrived at the area of the landing zone. But although the conditions had substantially improved it was impossible to locate the landing zone itself, owing to the failure of the link between the Eureka and Rebecca Beacons. After much endeavor and with fuel running low, the Halifax pilot decided to abort the operation and return to base. Shortly afterwards, however, the tug and glider combination encountered heavy cloud, and in the resulting turbulence the tow rope broke. The glider made a crash landing not far from where the other glider had come down, similarly inflicting several deaths and injuries. The Norwegians were unable to reach the crash sites in time, and the survivors eventually came into the hands of the Gestapo, who tortured them during interrogation, and later had them executed under Adolf Hitler's commando order. The most important consequence of the unsuccessful raid was that the Germans were now alerted to a determined allied interest in their heavy water production. The Norwegian Grouse team thereafter had a long arduous wait in their mountain hideaway, subsisting on moss and lichen during the winter until, just before Christmas, a reindeer was encountered. Operation Gunnicide British authorities were aware the Grouse team was still operational, and decided to mount another operation in concert with them. By this time the original Grouse team was being referred to as Swallow. On the night of 16 February 1943, in Operation Gunnicide, an additional six Norwegian commandos were dropped by parachute by a Halifax bomber of 138 Squadron from RAF Tempsford. They were successful in landing and encountered the Swallow team after a few days of searching on cross-country skis. The combined team made final preparations for their assault, which was to take place on the night of 27-28 February 1943. Supplies required by the commandos were dropped with them in special CLE containers. One of these was buried in the snow by a Norwegian patriot to hide it from the Germans. 
He later recovered it and in August 1976 handed it over to an officer of the British Army Air Corps, which was conducting exercises in the area. The container was brought back to England and was displayed in the Airborne Museum at Aldershot. The museum closed in 2008 and is now part of the Imperial War Museum Duxford. Following the failed freshman attempt, the Germans put mines, floodlights, and additional guards around the plant. While the mines and lights remained in place, security of the actual plant had slackened somewhat over the winter months. However, the single 75 meters bridge spanning the deep ravine, 200 meters above the river Mana, was fully guarded. The force elected to descend into the ravine, for the icy river, and climb the steep hill on the far side. The winter river level was very low, and on the far side, where the ground leveled. They followed a single railway track straight into the plant area without encountering any guards. Even before Grouse landed in Norway, so had a Norwegian agent within the plant who supplied detailed plans and schedule information. The demolition party used this information to enter the main basement by a cable tunnel and through a window. Inside the plant the only person they came across was the Norwegian caretaker, who was very willing to cooperate with them. The saboteurs then placed explosive charges on the heavy water electrolysis chambers, and attached a fuse allowing sufficient time for their escape. A Thompson submachine gun was purposely left behind, to indicate that this was the work of British forces and not of the local resistance, in order to try to avoid reprisals. A bizarre episode ensued, when fuses were about to be lit. The caretaker was worried about his spectacles which were lying somewhere in the room. A frantic search for the caretaker's spectacles ensued. They were found, and the fuses lit. The explosive charges detonated, destroying the electrolysis chambers. The raid was considered successful. The entire inventory of heavy water produced during the German occupation, over 500 kilograms, was destroyed along with equipment critical to operation of the electrolysis chambers. Although 3,000 German soldiers were dispatched to search the area for the commandos, all of them escaped. Five of them skied 400 kilometers to Sweden, two proceeded to Oslo where they assisted Malorg, and four remained in the region for further work with the resistance resumed operation and allied air raids. Although this attack did no irreparable damage to the plant, it did stop production for several months. The Vermork plant was restored by April, and so concluded that a repeat commando raid would be extremely difficult, as German security had been considerably improved almost as soon as production restarted. The USAF started a series of raids on Vermork. In November, the plant was attacked by a mass daylight bombing raid of 143 B-17 heavy bombers dropping 711 bombs, of which at least 600 missed the plant. The damage, however, was quite extensive. Then, on 16th and 18th of November 35 B-24 heavy bombers from the 392nd Bombers Group based in Wendling, Station 118, attacked the hydroelectric power station at Wichikan with excellent coverage of the target. These missions were the longest for this bomber group, lasting nine and a half and ten and a half hours respectively. The need for ground assaults was reduced from a year earlier as there was now an available alternative of night bombing, which had previously been unrealistic owing to German air cover. The Germans were convinced that air raids would result in further serious hits and they decided to abandon the plant and move remaining stocks and critical components to Germany in 1944. Brought to you by Wikivideo Documentaries. Would you like to know more?